digital signatures, so much that we do in cyberspace, involves a situation where Alice passes a document to Bob, which she needs to sign so that Bob knows for sure that Alice wrote this document. The way a signature is exercised today is mostly through the ECC and RSA and other algorithmic complexity solutions. The problem is that algorithmic complexity is essentially a crypt-analytic minefield full of potential ways in which somebody smart enough, dedicated enough, can find vulnerabilities that we, the designers of those complexity, don't see. Algorithmic complexity uh, flourished in the uh, last decades of the former century. So to find different paradigm, different approaches for the purpose of signature, we better go back into history. And in fact, one of the earliest methods for signature was uh, proposed by Leslie Lamport, one of the pioneers of computer science, a winner of the uh, uh, Turing Award, eventually. And he suggested something very simple, which was considered inconvenient and ignored, and now it acquires new interest. Here is what Lamport said. This is a bit string, just six bits for purpose of illustration, that Alice wants to prove to Bob that she read this string. She and not anybody else. To do so, Alice will select, let's say, six random numbers represented by these squares. And another set of six random numbers. We call it the first set and the second set. And then she will choose any good hash function, which takes a string of bits and represent it, represents it with a different string of bits, so that the reverse is difficult. There is an issue of how do we know it's difficult, but let's leave it aside for a moment. So Alice takes this function that that hash function and produces 12 numbers which are corresponding. This number generates this, 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 etc. throughout. These 12 numbers are considered the public key. These 12 numbers are Alice private key. Now, when Bob or anybody else submits this string to be signed, here is what Alice does. If this here is zero, she marks this number from the first pair. If this is one, she marks this. One, one, zero, zero, one. And then all the numbers that she marks, she provides Bob with those numbers. So now Bob can check that this corresponds, oh, excuse me, this corresponds to this, 
this corresponds to this, this to this, etc. So he can check that what Alice sent to him is really the the pre-image of the public key. But also because of the selection here that actually follows the contents of this string which she signed 011001 Bob knows that Alice was aware of this string. So this simple mechanism allows Alice to prove to Bob two things. A, she is the owner of the pre-image of the secret version of the public key. B, she is aware of this. Now this can be a generic signature of a large document and voila, Alice signs the large document. Okay, now what about the one-way function? that leads from the secret random number to the corresponding public number. We cannot prove that there is a function that only goes one way. Maybe somebody smart can reverse it. Yes. However, the Lampole methodology works with any one-way function. It's not limited to a particular mathematics like RSA and ECC. You could easily replace one function with another as fast as you can. Make it even part of a secret in some way. But the most important thing is that we have now more and more solutions that are based on lavish use of randomness to replace algorithmic complexity. And as more and more random rich hashing functions come up, the more and more Laporte looks attractive. And if you think about it, Digital money, Bitcoin or otherwise, relies, most of them, rely on digital signature to approve the transaction. So we cannot allow ourselves to be vulnerable and we have to dig deeper. Now, Lamport is a one-time signature because once you divulge half of your secret numbers, you cannot use this set again. We have solution for it with Merkle trees, but the important point is that hashing and other cryptographic tasks are moving away for some applications from the prevailing algorithmic complexity to the prospect of using randomness lavishly, which we can because Moore's law operates not only on processors but also on memory. The cost of memory to handle to communicate is very low and still dropping. See you next time.